welcome you to the Amazon Central Library. Um, this is a full house. For some of you, up all of our chairs, and we're proud of that fact. Um, I'd like to introduce this afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Laura Douglas. I'm one of the special collections librarians here at the Emmy Fowler Library. And I'd like to introduce Matt Oliver. He's the founder of the Denton Area Paranormal Society. And they're co sponsoring this program with us today. And he will introduce our new speaker. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for everybody for coming. There are a few chairs up here around in case somebody else is not sitting in them. Y'all can come on down and have a seat. Um, first off, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, it's been a long time coming for getting Jim to come speak to us. So we're all looking forward to hearing what he has to say. This is a pretty uh, interesting topic, too. Did anybody catch the UFO Hunter show that was on the History Channel here? They repeated it, what, Wednesday? Yeah. Okay. Well, that was all about, cool, that was all about this Aurora crash. It's right now by the Texas Motor Speedway. But you got to turn the way back meter on that one because, as our flyer states here, that happened in 1897. Anniversary is coming up next month on the 17th. And basically, the story was that uh, this aerial craft was seen all across the country. Here in Texas, it was seen on, uh, in Denton on the 16th. The 17th, it was seen in Aurora, and it crashed. Well, that's the story. Jim will get into that, and he's got some newspaper clippings back here from that day. Uh, and a Dallas Morning News uh, covered this crash here in Texas and just all across the country. And uh, But as far as Jim's concerned, let me just tell you that uh, he's a native of Fort Worth, Texas. He's an award-winning journalist, and he's been on several different television shows. They featured him on the UFO Hunter show. You all probably saw him walking around. He had a very small part, but he has a lot to say on the subject. So we're looking forward to hearing that. Um, he's been on Coast to Coast AM, uh, the radio show. Uh, he's been on several different uh, television shows as well. He's also uh, known for discussing uh, remote viewing. Uh, he kind of helped break that whole CIA kind of covered up program three years before we saw it in the news. Um, so there's a lot he can say about that topic too. But after we're done, we're going to have question and answers too. So. Please uh, go ahead and think about what you'd like to ask him. Uh, one of the best books he's got on the alien subject is an in-depth analysis that he put in a book that's on the table back here called Alien Agenda. Um, it's uh, been written up as one of the best sellers of all time on the UFO site. So if you haven't read that or you just want to get your copy signed, please do. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome up Jim Marks. Everybody welcome him. Can everybody hear me all right? I guess I'll need to speak up here. When this is good, I just need to move all around here. Um, oops. Yeah. Yeah, we'll leave it like that because I'm just going to move. Oh, there we, that's even better. Um, all right, I am Jim Mars, and I'm a native of this area. I grew up here in Fort Worth uh, about 30 years ago. Uh, my wife, who teaches public school, and I, who at that time was a uh, reporter for the Four Star Telegram, we looked at each other and decided, you know, we better get out of the city while the getting's good. So, for the last 30 years, we've lived on a, what I call a little ranchito uh, up in Wise County. Uh, I always tell out-of-staters that I raise registered quarter chickens. <laughs> you know what a quarter chicken is? Yeah, just 25 cents. <laughs> Cheap chickens. <laughs> but they lay eggs if the, if the raccoons don't get them. So anyway, I am a native of this area. I only live now about eight miles, I guess, from Aurora. So a lot of you are from this area. You've probably heard the story vaguely, a little of this, a little of that. It's floated around here for, of course, for years. I got, I got involved in it in 1973. And uh, when I first heard the story that, oh yeah, a spaceship crashed here in 1897 and the pilot was uh, not an inhabitant of this world, you know, I went, yeah, right. So I was as skeptical as anybody, but I want to tell you, and I flip-flopped over the years, as, as you'll see when I make my presentation. Um, first, I talk to somebody, and they say, oh, no, it's just all a hoax. Oh, okay. And then I talk to somebody else, and they say, no, my daddy was here. It really happened. I go, oh, well, maybe it did happen. So I went all around. But then the clincher, and I will we'll get to this towards the end of the program, was the scientific investigation that the UFO hunters did last summer 
that was the subject of the program that aired, uh, actually it aired back about Christmas time, and then I understand from last it was rerun here, uh, I believe Wednesday night, was that it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, unfortunately, the, you have an hour-long program and they got to dra dramatize things, and so I think maybe some of the pertinent points may have gotten lost, so, but we'll get to that. Okay, the Aurora spaceship crash in 1897. Uh, there we go. Uh, the basic story is, is that, and my Lord of Sand kind of got out of whack. But the basic story is that in 1897, April 17th, a silver cigar shaped object fluttered down near the earth, seemingly in some sort of trouble, struck a tower. Uh, of uh, Judge Proctor and uh, exploded with a big explosion. And uh, this will give you an idea if you don't know where Aurora is, it's just right there on 114 between Rome and, and Boyd. Um, this is what it looked like in 1973. Uh, the little building there is actually a little gas station at the time, and today it's been painted green and I think they sell curios and antiques or something, or I'm not even sure if it's still in business. But the little building's still there, and if you ever go by there, 114 is right over here, um, and then right behind here is a hill, and up on top of the hill is kind of a pink brick home, and it's right next to that home that the crash occurred. Uh, the home is now owned by the grandson of Brawley Oates, uh, who I interviewed back in 1973. The story was carried in the Dallas Morning News on April the 19th. And it said, I don't know if you can read that, I can barely read this little eight point type, but I'll just read you the story. It says, a windmill demolishes it. Aurora, Wise County, Texas, April 17th, to the news. About 6 o'clock this morning, the early risers of Aurora were astonished at the sudden appearance of the airship, which has been sailing through the country. It was traveling due north and much nearer the earth than ever before. Evidently, some of the machinery was out of order, for it was making a speed of only 10 or 12 miles. Any of you know anything about aviation, you know that what's airspeed? It's about 80, 90 miles an hour or more. You can't stay in the air at 10 or 12 miles and gradually settling toward the earth. It sailed directly over the public square, and when it reached the north part of town, collided with the tower of Judge Proctor's windmill and went to pieces with a terrific explosion, scattering debris over several acres of ground and wrecking the windmill and water tank and destroying the judge's flower garden. Uh, <laughs> the pilot of the ship is supposed to have been the only one on board, and while his remains are badly disfigured, Enough of the original has been picked up to show that he was not an inhabitant of this world. <laughs> Mr. T.J. Weems, the United States Signal Service officer at this place, which sounds fancy, I think he was the telegraph operator, but you know, that's all right. Um, and an authority on astronomy, probably had a telescope. <laughs> gives it his opinion that he was a native of the planet Mars. <laughs> okay. Well, now if you stop and think about it, look how we progressed. In the 50s, in the 60s, the big question was, do they come from Mars or do they come from Venus? And then we got a little more sophisticated in our knowledge, and by the 80s and 90s, it was, uh, do they come from Alpha Centauri or Zeta Reticula 4? <coughs> And today, we're in a little bit more advanced in our sophistication and our knowledge, and the question now is, do they come from another solar system, another galaxy, or do they come from another dimension, or perhaps another time? So we're slowly but surely getting there. But back then, he thought he came from Mars. Uh, the ship was too badly wrecked to form any conclusion as to its construction or motive power, it was built of an unknown metal, resembling somewhat a mixture of aluminum and silver, and it must have weighed several tons. The town is full of people today who are visiting the wreck and gathering specimens 
of the strange metal from the debris, the pilot's funeral will take place at noon tomorrow. The Fort Worth Record, which was a, this was in the Dallas Morning News, which of course is still in publication. In uh, Fort Worth, it was the Fort Worth Record that carried the account, and uh, they said the pilot was given a Christian burial in the Aurora Cemetery. So we took care of that guy from Mars. Um, and uh, that was about the extent of what most everybody knew. The, there's the story, and here is a picture of the tombstone that was published uh, in May 1973 in the Dallas uh, Morning News. Um, I correct, I need to correct that, that's not true. That was in the Dallas Times Herald. And the way I know this is because it says the photo by Bill Case. Bill Case was the aviation writer for the Dallas Times Herald, which is now defunct. And I was his counterpart at the Star Telegram at that time. I had to start off as a police reporter. And by 1973, I was the military aviation and aerospace writer. So I do know a little bit about aviation and aerospace. In fact, uh, I uh, made a deal with Ed Boardman, who had a flight school at Meacham Field. And I wrote some articles for him for an industry publication, and he gave me free flight lessons. And I had 12 or 15 hours in, plus all the schooling, and all I lacked was my solo flight to get my pilot's license. But it suddenly dawned on me, hey, I'm just an old poorly paid reporter. I can't afford to buy an airplane. <laughs> and I said, I can't even afford to go out and rent an airplane every few months, you know? And by that time, I had learned enough to know that uh, in any of you that know aviation, if you don't stay proficient, then you practically, you know, if you go six months a year or more and you hadn't flown, then you practically have to start all over again. So I was a flight school dropout. <laughs> but I just, so I was a flight school dropout. <laughs> but I just tell you that because I do know about aviation. There is a state historical marker. My picture's kind of blurry, not real good. But what it says is this site is also well known because of the legend that a spaceship crashed nearby in 1897 and the pilot killed in the crash was buried here. And that was erected in 1976. That was after my experience in 73. Here's a photograph, color photograph, of the little uh, headstone. And as you can see, it's, it was kind of unusual. They had used chalk to accentuate the outline, but there was like this inverted V with these little circles up here, and there actually there are more than these two. I think there's another one here. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, here's a close-up photograph of it. You can see the circle here, 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 and here. Um, my thought was, you can see how it seems to be broken off on one side, and uh, I'm kind of under the opinion that uh, somewhere along the line, uh, the right half of this thing had been broken off, and if you were to add this much to the headstone and then, and then flip the image here over to here, you've got a saucer-shaped object. Whoop, turn back my stubby fingers. You've got a stubby, you've got a uh, cigar-shaped object with uh, little portholes in it. So that was really uh, interesting. Now, um, at, in 1973, uh, Bill Case uh, had a metal detector, and he ran it over the little grave site, and we found readings for metal in that grave in three different places, one up near where the headstone was, and then two fairly close together towards the middle of the grave, and the grave, by the way, was no much, not much longer than about that. It was a very short grave, uh, almost a child or a midget or a very short little guy. And so we both went back and wrote stories for our respective papers saying, well, you know, Let's exhume the grave. Then we'll know. We'll know what's down there, if anything. And we'll find out what's going on here. Well, the Aurora Cemetery Association got all upset, and they hired a lawyer, and he threatened an injunction against anyone who would go into the cemetery and try to dig up Grandma. And uh, all kinds of specious arguments. You know, they had had, uh, they had, had a spotted fever epidemic. They didn't want to, they didn't want to ch chance on that, get the news. And, and bless you, disturbing the sanctity of the cemetery. Well, of course, we never had any intention of doing anything to the grave anyway. We just offered and said, why, why don't they have an exhumation? Which, of course, would have required a, a court order. 
But since they were threatening an injunction, nothing was done. However, these stories appeared in the Dallas Fort Papers. In the spring of 1973, he had a lot of uh, thrill seekers, sight seekers, driving around and driving around the cemetery, and the people got a little bit perturbed, so they put up a police guard. And during the day, the town marshal, uh, Pig Adell, uh, would guard the cemetery, and then at night, they had the Wise County Deputy Sheriff that would come up and set up on the cemetery all through the night. And uh, that went on for about two weeks. And then, as the excitement died down, everybody forgot about it, and the sightseers quit coming, they pulled the police guard. The very day they pulled the police guard, a little headstone went missing and has not been seen since. Any of you young people want to go on an expedition, I understand that one of the rumors is that the cemetery association upset because of all the publicity, took the little headstone, went down, there's a creek bed way down the hill to the east of the cemetery and they just threw it down in that creek bed. So any of you all want to go down there and run around and see if you can find it, that'd be great. Uh, uh, last summer I thought about doing that, but I went down there and got caught up in all the cat briar <laughs> and the mesquite <laughs> and the cactus and the fire ants, and I said, I think I'll leave this to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of the tombstone. I'll give you one other little added thing here. A couple of months after all of this, Bill Case called me up and he said, meet me at the Aurora Cemetery. So I did. He got his metal detector out, went over to where the little grave site was, ran, up, ran the metal detector over it, and no readings. There was no metal in that grave. And yet the grave obviously had not been disinterred. So I said, well, what's going on here? He said, come here, look. So we got on our hands and knees and got down there and looked, and up there where the headstone had been, and where the, we'd shown some metal, and towards the middle, the middle of the grave where we'd shown evidence of metal, there were little holes drilled in the ground. Somebody had come in there with some very sophisticated equipment, located the metal in the grave, used something like a core sampler to go in there in little grapples, and it extracted this metal out of the grave. And I said, Bill, who do you think did that? Do you think the UFO researchers did that? And he said, no, I don't think so, and I didn't either. I said, well, who do you think did that? And he said, I think the government did that. And I think he's telling the truth. And of course, when you find out that this all fits in, as Lance mentioned, the Great Airship Mystery of 1896-97. Starting in the fall of 1896, out Sacramento, California, they started reporting seeing a huge silver cigar-shaped object flying in the air. Now this is 1896. This is seven years before the Wright brothers flew. And this to me is really interesting too because once I began to research and wrote my book, Alien Agenda, which is now, I am told, the top-selling non-fiction book on UFOs in the world because I've got about, it's been translated into about a dozen languages. I've even got a Bulgarian edition, a <laughs> Turkish edition, and a weird, you know, Korean. Um, but the Great Airship Mystery of 1896-97 uh, is very well documented. And this craft was seen then moving northward, was seen up near Seattle, then began to move eastward, was seen as far east as Chicago, and then during early 1897, it was seen coming down through the Midwest, Kansas, Oklahoma, and by April of uh, 1897, it was seen over North Texas in various places. One of the questions I'm always asked is, well, you know, if these are not humans and they're here and they're visiting us, why don't they just land and say, you know, live long and prosper, you know, we come in peace, take me to your leader, or whatever they say. I think the answer can be found in a story in this same edition of the Dallas Morning News, Dateline, uh, Granbury, Hood County. Newt Grisham last night at 9.30 o'clock, while drilling the riddle rifles, discovered that mysterious flying Jenny of which we've heard so much. Newt is a very worsome young man, being a populist, but he could not stand the sight of the air machine, so he ordered the company to open fire on the object, which it did, and the whole town was soon aroused. What is it, Joe Bob? Oh, no, shoot at it. <laughs> Maybe that's why they don't come in the land. Okay? So this is the Great Mystery of 1896 97, and it takes us up to April of 1897, and then we have the story about the explosion, the crash, and the burial of the pilot in Aurora. 
And folks, after that, all stories stopped. Hmm. More support that something was really going on. And always keep in mind, this is six years before the Wright brothers ever flew. Having dealt with UFOs, I always, you know, everybody, well, first off, let's go back. Some of you older folks will remember back 50, 60. They told us there's no such thing. It's just hallucinations. Uh, it, it's uh, some sort of mass psychosis. You know, even then, as a young reporter, I thought, wow, an heretofore undiagnosed contagious mass psychosis. What a great story. <laughs> but you never hear any stories about that because that's not what's happening. And today, you never hear anybody argue that there's nothing there. It's just hallucinations or mass psychosis. Why? Because with the advent of the camcorder, and now today, these little cell phones that all the kids have, but, you know, you got to be, they're up on the Internet. There are thousands and thousands of photographs of UFOs. They're real, folks, and they're there. So now the question, this was the title of my book, now the question is not, are they real or are they here? The question is, what's their agenda? Who are they? Well, they won't. So now the question, this was the title of my book, now the question is not, are they real or are they here? The question is, what's their agenda? Who are they? Well, they won't. And of course, now the argument is, well, it's just misidentified aircraft, okay? Or possibly secret government test craft, okay? Well, <laughs> okay, so I'm thinking, wouldn't it be great if we had a really well-documented case before any of that was in the air? And we do. Aurora, Texas, 1897. So this is why I consider the Aurora spaceship crash the smoking gun of the UFO issue. Because this occurred at a time when there was nothing man-made in the air. It certainly wasn't secret government testing. Now, one of the problems was that today, Miss Rosalie Gregg, a very nice, nice southern lady, uh, is head of the Wise County Historical Society, and for years her close friend was Robbie Hansen. Um, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, her close friend was Anna Pegues, who was friends with Robbie Hansen, who was alive as a young girl in 1897. Well, Robbie Hansen would tell Anna Pegues, who happened to be the correspondent for the Star Telegram, it never happened. It was just a hoax. So people would call up the Star Telegram and say, what about the Aurora spaceship crash? They'd put him in touch, or put him in touch with Edith McGee's, and she'd tell him it's all a hoax. And then she would tell her close friend, Rosalie Gregg, it was just all a hoax. And so that's what they said for years. Okay, being a good reporter, I went through Rosalie, back to Edith McGee's, back to Robbie Hansen, and by her own story, she had no first-hand knowledge at all. She didn't even know anything. First, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, it's been a long time coming for getting Jim to come speak to us, so we're all looking forward to hearing what he has to say. This is a pretty uh, interesting topic, too. Did anybody catch the UFO Hunter show that was on the History Channel here? They repeated it, what, Wednesday? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that was all about, cool, that was all about this Aurora crash. It's right now by the Texas Motor Speedway. But you got to turn the way back meter on that one because, as our flyer states here, that happened in 1897. Anniversary is coming up next month on the 17th, and <clears throat> basically the story was that uh, this aerial craft was seen all across the country. Here in Texas, it was seen on uh, in Denton on the 16th, the 17th it was seen in Aurora, and it crashed. Well, that's the story. Jim will get into that, and he's got some newspaper clippings back here from that day, uh, and the Dallas Morning News uh, covered this crash here in Texas, and just all across the country. And, uh, but as far as Jim's concerned, let me just tell you that uh, he's a native of Fort Worth, Texas. He's an award-winning journalist, and he's been on several different television shows. They featured him on the UFO Hunter show. Y'all probably saw him walking around. He had a very small part, but he has a lot to say. Everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the Emily Thomas Central Library. Uh, this is a full house for some of you to follow our parents. Um, I'd like to introduce this afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Laura Douglas. I'm one of the special collections librarians here at the Emmy Fowler Library. And I'd like to introduce Matt Fowler. He's the founder of the Denton Area Paranormal Society. And they're co sponsoring this program with us today. And he will introduce our new speaker. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. There are a few chairs up here around in case somebody else is not sitting in them. Y'all can come on down and have a seat. Um, 
analysis that he put in a book that's on the table back here called Alien Agenda. Um, it's uh, been written up as one of the best sellers of all time on the UFO site. So if you haven't read that or you just want to get your copy signed, please do. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome up Jim Mars. Everybody welcome him. Can everybody hear me all right? I guess I'll need to speak up here. This is good. I just need to move all around here. Um, oops. On the subject. So we're looking forward to hearing that. Uh, he's been on Coast to Coast AM, uh, the radio show. Uh, he's been on several different uh, television shows as well. He's also uh, known for discussing uh, remote viewing. Uh, he kind of helped break that whole CIA kind of covered up program three years before we saw it in the news. Um, so there's a lot he could say about that topic too. But after we're done, we're going to have question and answers too. So please uh, go ahead and think about what you'd like to ask him. Uh, one of the best books he's got on the alien subject is uh, In-Depth 